Hello, and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 267. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. Forensic genetic genealogists are continuing to make the news as they're helping law enforcement solve cold cases. And some of these are really old cases. It's an emerging career field and there are courses online that can help you learn what it takes to be a forensic genealogist and as well how to do it professionally. And one of those courses is the online graduate certificate in forensic genetic genealogy. It's at the University of New Haven, Connecticut. Dr. Claire Glenn is the founder of that program, and she's an associate professor in the Department of Forensic Science. That's in the Henry C. Lee College of Criminal Justice and Forensic Sciences at the University of New Haven. And it's really the first program of its kind in the country. And she's been a sought after uh, consultant. She's an expert in this field. And uh, she teaches undergraduate and graduate courses and conducts extensive research. It's all focused on forensic biology, forensic DNA analysis, and forensic genetic genealogy. So I've invited her to the show today to talk with us about what a forensic genetic genealogist does, uh, how you might be able to become one, and what we can look forward to in the future in this really exciting field. Welcome to the show, Claire. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm a big fan of this show. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. And I know everybody listening and watching are going to be uh, really intrigued because this is such an exciting, emerging kind of a field. And you've really been out there on the forefront of it. So I think we should probably start at the beginning, which is what is a forensic genetic genealogist? <laughs> Well, that's a great question to start off with, because lots of people are always very curious about it, uh, especially because it's such a brand new field. Really, we can uh, say that this field established at the forefront of forensic investigations uh, in early 2018. Now, the term forensic genealogy had actually been around since, I think, 2002. Mm -hmm. But forensic genealogy is really a different thing to forensic genetic genealogy. Uh, forensic genetic genealogy is all about taking everything that we know about genetic genealogy, so GG, as I like to call it, uh, and applying that to a criminal investigation. So either into an investigation of what we call unidentified human remains or UHRs, or as the public more commonly know them as, as jo Jane and John Doe cases. So identifying unidentified human remains or in what we call suspect cases, whereby we have DNA left behind at a crime scene by a perpetrator of a violent crime, such as homicide or sexual assault, and trying to identify who that perpetrator is by using our genetic genealogy skills. Wow, it's, it's an incredible field. It's amazing how it just kind of burst onto the scene. And mm. as you mentioned, it is quite different than forensic genealogy. Um, so this is yes. all about the genetics, the DNA, um, and mm -hmm. uh, you said that it kind of came out more around 2018 or so. The Golden State Killer case really had a lot to do with bringing this to the forefront, didn't it? It certainly did. It's it's what brought it to the forefront of the media, for sure. And it's certainly the most highly publicized case for forensic genetic genealogy. Um, however, right at the exact same time as the for, as the Golden State Killer case was announced, there was also the other application of forensic genetic genealogy to unidentified human remains cases. The DNA Doe project at that time, right before the announcement of the Golden State Killer, had used successfully uh, forensic genetic genealogy as we know it now to identify the remains of uh, the Buckskin Girl, which was a case from the early 1980s of an unidentified human remains case. So really it was the kind of culmination of several people doing this all at once, but independently on different cases. Um, and then it was the announcement of the Golden State Killer that really brought it to the forefront of people's minds. Because, I mean, can you think of a more prolific uh, uh, serial uh, homicide investigation in US history? I mean, there's several, but that has certainly been one that's been very high profile over the last four to five decades. Absolutely. I grew up in Modesto, California during that time oh, wow. frame. And, you know, I remember people yeah. being afraid and starting to lock their doors. Yes. 
On yes. the same front, my daughter is a forensic anthropologist, and so she's been fascinated awesome. by, by <laughs> the other side of the coin that you were talking about. Uh -huh. um, so I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background and kind of um, how you got into this. And I know that you've worked with criminal law enforcement and things in the past. Tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about where, where you come from. Yeah, sure. Well, if you can't tell by the accent, this isn't a Connecticut accent. No, <laughs> no it's not. Uh, I was born and raised in the west of Ireland, uh, in County Galway, uh, the most beautiful part of Ireland, the most beautiful place you'll ever see in, in, in the world. Of course. Um, and so I come from a, a very education focused family. My both my my parents worked at a university. Uh, they're both retired now. My father is a physicist. Um, and so I grew up on a, a university campus, essentially oh, right. going there every day after from a very young age to do my homework. Um, and so when it came around to the time for me to be applying to university and things like that, uh, my father actually brought me uh, at the front page of the Irish Times newspaper. And on that front page was an article about a brand new bachelor's degree program that was being brought into Ireland, a BS in pharmaceutical and forensic science. There had never been a forensic science educational program in Ireland prior to that. And my father said to me, I think you'd be a great forensic scientist. And bear in mind, this is the year, so we're talking 2000, uh, at the turn of the millennium, um, when F CSI had just come out on the TV, right? So it was just out. People were kind of enthralled with this show. So was I. And I was like, but is that actually a really a career? Like, do people actually <laughs> do that? Um, and as the more I looked into it, it is. It is indeed. It had been around for decades so, as a career. And so I was very intrigued by this. And my father said to me as well, importantly, with his great insight, um, he said, you know, you should choose a degree program and a career based upon the qualities and characteristics that you have, not just because it sounds cool, right? <laughs> and so he said, a forensic scientist, you know, should be very good at science, which I was. That was where I was getting all my A's in school, not, not many A's in the other subjects. Um, but also you should be very compassionate and wanting to help people, which I was constantly rescuing animals off the street and bringing them home without my parents' permission. Uh, and also my dad said, importantly, you're very nosy. So <laughs> that would lend itself very well to the, a career as a forensic scientist. Um, so I decided to become a forensic scientist based upon that. I, though coming from Ireland where university education is completely free, um, well, it was at the time, uh, uh, my father said, you know, don't be their guinea pig for this new program. Let them kind of find their feet for a few years. Uh, go do another undergraduate degree first and then do that one. So I went and did a BA in psychology because I thought it would be important to understand about human behavior uh, and the human mind and, and indeed criminal behavior uh, and that that would lend itself well to my future career as a forensic investigator. So I did that degree and then immediately afterwards I did my bachelor's of science in pharmaceutical and forensic science. And during the third year of that program, so in US terms, the junior year of that program, you have to do a six month industrial placement, which is kind of a fancy way of saying internship. <laughs> and um, for that internship, I uh, went to the UK to uh, a private company called uh, LGC Forensics. Uh, because in the United Kingdom, all of um, the forensic science industry is completely privatized. It's not government run at all. Um, and so I managed to get a research position within the within that company. So I worked my butt off for six months for them for free, working on um, a, a research project in the forensic biology unit there. Uh, at the end of that, uh, they were very impressed with me and so they wanted me to stay on and become a full-time forensic biology examiner for them but I had to go home and finish my senior year first otherwise my father wouldn't be very happy um, and so I did that and then immediately returned uh, to LGC Forensics where I started working immediately as a, a full-time forensic biology examiner. That job entails working major crime investigations of homicide and sexual assault that occur all over England and Wales. So it was a very high volume lab. It, we had, I was, I think the biggest surprise I had in that job was the volume of major crime that comes into one lab. 
uh, you know, you don't see them all reported in the newspapers. So whenever you're actually working in that laboratory and you see the number of homicides, the number of sexual assaults that do occur, it really is quite shocking. So then after a couple of years, a few years there, um, and after amassing probably uh, working a thousand major crimes during that time, um, I decided it was time to get my PhD because I had always wanted to get one um, because I wanted to kind of be a part of solving a big puzzle. I wanted to uh, help the society in any way possible and uh, and contribute to something important. Um, and so with that, there's not many doctorate programs or PhD programs that uh, are focused on forensic science across the world. It's really due to a massive lack in funding um, for research topics such as that. So instead, I decided to uh, enroll in a doctorate program that would teach me a lot about genetics, that would teach me a lot about molecular biology, because all of the skills that I would learn there would be transferable back to the forensic science or forensic DNA industry. So I did my PhD in breast cancer research. Uh, I worked, I, I did my PhD in one of the most phenomenal labs uh, in the world. Uh, they are really truly making a huge impact in uh, helping patients, uh, uh, patient outcomes and, and patients, patient diagnosis for breast cancer research. Then um, once I finished that up, I said it's back time to return back to the forensic science industry. Uh, and I was thankfully offered a position at the University of New Haven as a assistant professor at the time. Um, and if any of your listeners uh, know about forensic science, they'll know that the University of New Haven is the number one institution, number one university in the United States for forensic science education. The captain of our ship is Dr. Henry C. Lee, uh, one of the world's most world-renowned forensic scientists. Uh, and so just having that opportunity to even be associated with Dr. Lee and the University of New Haven, I jumped at it. So I joined the faculty at the University of New Haven in 2014, August 2014. Um, and I've been there ever since. I said I would move over across the pond to the United States, to Connecticut, to New England. Um, and if I, uh, I'd give it a year, and if I didn't like it, I'd move on elsewhere. And eight years later, <laughs> I'm still there. Uh, so it looks like I'm, I'm staying for, for the long haul. Um, uh, so I'm very happy in my position there at the University of New Haven. Uh, in terms of forensic genetic genealogy, uh, bear in mind, I was uh, a, I, I was, I am and, and was at the time considered a forensic DNA expert. That was where all of my expertise lay in forensic biology. So body fluid analysis, uh, being able to correctly identify a particular body fluid from a crime scene or from a piece of evidence, and then um, extracting a DNA profile from that and interpreting that DNA profile from that with our regular forensic STR profiling. Um, however, I had a long running history and, and passion for genealogy. It was my hobby, right? As many people's hobby is genealogy. It's the second most popular hobby in the world after um, uh, gardening, I believe. And so I'd kind of been doing that all along uh, on the side um, uh, as my hobby. And then as I had also uh, worked several uh, adoption cases and unknown parentage cases, including my own, as I am also adopted. I knew who my biological mother was, but I didn't have any idea of who my biological father was. Then using genetic genealogy, I uh, made that identification. And on the high of that, I started to help other people do that. And, you know, I, I, as I'm sure you've felt as well in the past, um, you, you get those solves and you get so excited that you just want to help more. Um, so then April 2018, when the Golden State Killer investigation was announced and the uh, prime suspect had been identified, I thought, oh, my gosh, my two worlds have collided. <laughs> <laughs> my hobby of genetic genealogy and then my career and expertise as a forensic DNA scientist. I was like, this is the perfect mesh for it. Uh, and ever since then, I've just been hooked. So with that in mind, um, and you know, having been a self-taught genetic genealogist, uh, I thought, okay, well, there's a massive need out there for a coherent program of study for forensic genetic genealogy. And I thought who better and where better else to uh, establish that than at the University of New Haven. 
Stay right there. We've got more forensic genealogy right after this. Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full-service experience that bridges your past, present, and future. The MyHeritage DNA Kit reveals your ethnic origins and finds your new relatives based on shared DNA. It's popular all over the world, and their constantly growing DNA database means that more matches to new relatives are just around the corner. You'll receive a percentage breakdown of your ethnic origins from 42 supported regions and weekly email updates as new DNA matches are found. It's also the leading DNA service for anyone with European origins. Make the most of your DNA results with a MyHeritage subscription and access advanced tools for genetic genealogy, like the theory of family relativity, autoclusters, shared ancestral places, and much more. Order your kit today at myheritage.com DNA. Already taken a DNA test with another service? Upload your DNA data to MyHeritage for free to receive DNA matches and access new discoveries. That's myheritage.com slash DNA. Now back to our conversation with Dr. Claire Glenn. And interesting in hearing your background, what you've really done, I think, for our audience is help kind of lay out the path and also show that uh, to a certain extent, this is all new territory. So you can kind of yeah, um, follow your passions and, and um, mm-hmm. you know, create the situation that works best for you. I remember watching a series, uh, I think it was on crime, ITTV or something. Uh, they were talking about the Golden State Killer case and it was before it was solved. And I remember just practically yelling at the television and saying, why don't you go check the, the DNA databases? <laughs> exactly. You know, and then very quickly all that started happening. So it, it's exciting to see these worlds colliding, exactly. as you said. Yeah. It and, really is. And, and, you know, I wish I had been the one that came up with the <laughs> idea to apply genetic genealogy to criminal investigations. I should have because of the industry that I work in, but I didn't. Um, yeah. Thankfully, there were trailblazers ahead of me, uh, such as Margaret Press, Colleen Fitzpatrick, CC Moore, Barbara Ray Venter. Um, you know, those individuals that were already doing it before many of us even had the idea to do it. Well, and we've had many of those uh, distinguished women on the on the Genealogy Gems podcast, mm-hmm. and and I I like you. I had some ideas about it, but I I've got all kinds of friends in the industry, and I never said anything to anybody, so they all yes. figured it out. <laughs> exactly. But, but I love what you're doing. Is I think it sounds like you're really uh, creating a structure so that more people can enter the field. So I'd love to have you tell yeah. us about the program and. Uh, you mentioned sure. it's a certificate. So my guess is at this mm-hmm. point, we're not looking at, there's not certification available yet, but there is a, a mm-hmm. certificate and a field of study. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, with certification and then doing a graduate certificate in anything, they're two very different things. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do a graduate certificate or even an undergraduate certificate in many fields of study. Um, and especially today, you know, uh, especially in the last three to five years, uh, higher education has seen a huge demand for what we call micro credentials, which are certificates, right? Because they're not full degree programs. They aren't 33 credits or 120 credits for a bachelor's, 30, 30 plus credits for a, a master's degree. A certificate, and here in the state of Connecticut by the Office of Higher Education, um, a certificate is 12 credits or more. Right. It needs to be a minimum of 12 credits, 12 university credits. And so with our graduate certificate, the program itself is 12 credits. So four courses of three credits. There is an optional elective or additional elective that's available as well. So it could be 15 credits if you want. So with the program, um, whenever I set, sat down to kind of say, OK, I need to plan a program. I need to develop a program in this. We have the infrastructure here at the University of New Haven to be able to do so. Uh, we have, you know, the online learning management system. Um, and also we have kind of the prestige in the criminal justice and forensic science field that people would want to take a program like this with us. And so I said, well, what would I include in a, in a program such as this? 
And what I was seeing, and thankfully, you know, I have to say a thanks to all of the online Facebook groups and forums and everything surrounding forensic or investigative genetic genealogy. I was reading the comments and I was reading the questions of what people want to learn and what they're lacking in their knowledge currently and what they're hungry for. So I could see that there is a lot of not misinformation, but uh, confused information as to what already happens in a forensic DNA investigation. What do we currently do? Forensic genetic genealogy aside, when we have a crime, what is the physical evidence that is at a crime scene? How do we collect it? How do we preserve it? What do we do with it? How do we say that this red stain is blood or this whitish stain is semen? How do we tell that? What chemical tests do we use to do that? Then importantly, what DNA information can we get out of that sample? What type of DNA analysis do we perform to either compare it from a suspect DNA profile that has been collected or run it through our criminal DNA database, such as CODIS here in the United States, or uh, it's called L something else in other countries. Um, and what's the process for all of that? And what are the rules and the regulations and, and the criteria and the standards that we have to adhere to for analyzing all of those types of samples. Also things like uh, touch or transfer DNA analysis, so minute quantities of DNA, or recovering DNA from heavily compromised samples, such as um, uh, skeletal remains, highly decomposed bones, uh, teeth, things like that. So I could see that people weren't really, uh, a, a large uh, portion of the comments that I was seeing was people being curious about, well, how do we do this? Why can't we connect GEDmatch to CODIS. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 they're apples and oranges. They're two di very different things. So I thought, okay, well, the first course in the program should be a fundamentals of forensic biological evidence. So what do we currently do? What is our regular forensic DNA profiling process? And what is CODIS? And what are, our, what are our national criminal DNA databases? And then importantly, this is one people often get confused, is what is familial DNA searching? Because that is not forensic genetic genealogy at all. That is something else that we've been doing for years in the forensic community, whereby we're comparing STR, short tandem repeat forensic DNA profiles within a criminal DNA database looking for uh, first order direct relatives, so aunts, uncles, parents, siblings. Um, and with that, I said, okay, that's the first course. So that gets people up to speed of what do we do in a regular forensic investigation? Because currently as the Department of Justice um, interim policy regarding forensic genetic genealogy, all of that has to happen before an FGG investigation is even begun. So then the second course is, right, well, what is forensic genetic genealogy? What can we do with the results from consumer DNA testing? What are the databases that we are allowed to use, such as GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA? What can we do with the genetic data that we can harvest from those databases? What's a center Morgan? You know, what does shared DNA mean? Um, uh, and what tools are out there to help us decipher this information? So that's the second course, is going through all of that in-depthly, going through the X chromosome, the Y chromosome, autosomal consumer DNA testing, uh, and also importantly, the ethical implications and privacy implications of doing this type of analysis. Then after the genetic genealogy component, so we've put it into our database, into GEDmatch or Family Tree DNA. We find our top 10 matches. We have our Centimorgan value. We use our shared CM project tool to infer what potential relationship that is. We start to build a family tree using that genetic data or genetic information because it's not necessarily data, it's, it's information. And then how do we build those trees out further of the non-genetic matches because they're not in the database? 
and how do we um, uh, use traditional genealogy, as I like to call it. Some people don't like it when I call it traditional genealogy, though. They may, they, I, I understand their reasoning, though, because it sort of makes it sound like that's the old way of doing it. But it's not. <laughs> it's what we currently do mm -hmm. with our regular genealogy of finding those records and also, importantly, um, verifying those records and making sure that they're true and accurate. Uh, and all of the different um, genealogy standards and the genealogy proof standard and adhering to all of uh, essentially the rules, as I like to call them, uh, from the board for the certification of genealogists. That's the third course. So you're taught what do we do in forensic investigations? What's genetic genealogy? What's regular genealogy? So genealogy principles and methods. And then the fourth course, the final course in the program is our forensic genetic genealogy practicum. So that practicum, it's not a traditional course, right? There's no lecture material. There's no videos to watch each week. There's no readings for you to do. It's here's a mock case, go solve it. Everything that you've learned over the three previous courses, apply that to this case. So with that, I create mock uh, cases of Jane and John Doe's, or they could be suspect cases. Uh, and basically, I provide the student with a, a GEDmatch kit number that I've uploaded. I've gotten permission. It's gone through our institutional review board approval for uh, inclusion in this. Uh, and the volunteer who gave me the DNA, their DNA um, data set uh, has uh, provided informed consent and I anonymize that sample and then I provide the students with the kit numbers and I say, okay, here's your case. This is a Jane Doe, uh, estimated age 30 to 50 years, uh, possibly Caucasian or possibly Latina or possibly African American and then they have to run with it and they have to um, apply everything that they've learned to try and solve the case. And from this past cohort, so we, we completed our um, first cohort in uh, August, September there, uh, around that time. Um, the results were phenomenal from the practicum. I was overwhelmed and overjoyed with the uh, excellence of the students from our first cohort and their ability to correctly identify people within uh, their practicum. There's also the opportunity, um, we have some internships available because we've uh, established very collaborative uh, partnerships with some of the uh, forensic genetic genealogy providers out there. Uh, and many of them are reaching out to me now asking, can we take some of your students next year? which is great to see. Um, and so with that, this past year, we had some students uh, intern with the DNA Doe project where uh, they were mentored by the uh, excellent people at the DNA Doe project. Um, I have to give a shout out to Gabrielle Vargas and also to Margaret Press there. They were truly phenomenal with our students. Um, and they worked actual real cases, unidentified human remains cases, and they successfully identified at least one. I think there's been two now. Um, so for that type of outcome, I mean, I couldn't have asked for anything better than that to know that the, the students have been trained to a professional level that they're uh, successfully able to apply everything that they've learned. And then similarly, you know, with the mock cases that uh, the other students were given to see that they were able to successfully identify really was just absolutely outstanding. Oh, it must have been um, exciting for you just as the instructor and yes. seeing it all come together. Extremely. Did you find that the people <laughs> who were signing up for that course, were they interested in trying to do this professionally and make a, a paid career out of it? Are there just lots of people who would give anything just to donate their time and be part of this kind of work? So the, the short answer to that, Lisa, is both, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think what I, I get asked quite a lot is like, what type of student applies to this program. And I was just going through my spreadsheet this morning for the upcoming program that starts in just two weeks of our mm -hmm. new cohort, our, our 20, 2022 cohort of students. And the breakdown is pretty much the same as our first cohort. I like to look at it as there's the law enforcement affiliated group and then there's the non-law enforcement affiliated group. So the law enforcement affiliated group of students are the ones that already work 
for law enforcement in some capacity or another, be it they're a death investigator, a DNA analyst in a crime state or federal or private crime lab, um, they're police officers, they're detectives, they're intelligence analysts, they're already working in law enforcement in some capacity. And so they're enrolling in the programme because they want to add this additional skill set uh, to their portfolio or to their resume and apply the knowledge that they learn through this program to their current work. So they're not looking for employment, right? They already have it. Right. They're just looking to add it. This is the, the whole kind of push really that we see massively in demand for micro credentials, people already in their career that want to add to their credentials to help them move further within the career of their already current job that they have. Then um, the other side of it, where there is non-law enforcement um, affiliated students, they come from such a diverse background. It's fascinating to see. In last year's cohort, I had a librarian, I had an airline pilot, I had uh, an attorney, non, non-criminal attorney, a business oh. attorney. I had a lighting specialist, you know, <laughs> but I, I, I remember thinking I'm a little bit nervous, you know, accepting some of these students into the program because, you know, where are they going to go with this and, and are they going to be able to keep up with the program because of, you know, not already knowing the law enforcement side? And I'll tell you, they were some of the best in the program. <laughs> they really were. They absolutely blew my mind away. Um, and I'm seeing very similar um, backgrounds in the uh, applicants and, and the accepted students into the program that I have for this coming 2022 cohort. Very, very, very diverse backgrounds. Some of the non-law enforcement people are already working professionally as genealogists, mm -hmm. not specifically forensic genealogists. I have a couple of um, already board certified genealogists. I have some people that have been working as search angels um, for several years or already working for one of the private forensic genetic genealogy providers and want to gain this credential essentially to add to their resume. Um, so it's kind of it, whenever I get asked you know, I, I get emails and on a near weekly basis of what are the employment opportunities? What are your statistics for, you know, employment upon graduation? You can't really give statistics for a micro credential such as a, a certificate program because not everyone's in it to get a job at the end. And also, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, um, and this is true for certainly a handful of the students from last year's cohort and probably for um, this coming year's cohort is people just want to add um, to their skill set and their knowledge and volunteer their time uh, as a retiree or, you know, they're taking a break from work for a while and they just want to do this on a volunteering basis in the future. So really quite a diverse group. Also, I think it's fascinating to know, um, and you probably won't be surprised about this, but 95% uh, of the students in this coming year's cohort, the 2022 cohort, are 95% are female and 5% are male. And interestingly as well, the average age is exactly 45 years of age, uh, with our youngest student being 21 years of age and our oldest being 72. So again, a, a very diverse demographic of student. Wow, that is fascinating. Oh, one last thing, one yeah. last thing, one last thing on the demographic. Sorry, I forgot to mention because um, I just pulled it up this morning and was going through it. Uh, we have nearly 30 states represented of students oh. coming from nearly 30 different states and then several from Australia, Canada and also the UK. Not surprised. I know there's lots of genealogists down there. <laughs> I've talked a lot to lots, of, yes. lots of them. Stay right there. We've got more forensic genealogy right after this. Today's episode is sponsored by newspapers.com, the largest online newspaper archive. Newspapers.com makes it easier than ever to find your family's story with more than a half a billion digitized newspaper pages from the 1690s to today. Did your dad win a big game in high school? Did your great grandma win a bake off? Whether it's a familiar family story or a new discovery, the possibilities for what you might find on newspapers.com are endless. The simple to use tools and search features make it easy to discover, save, and share the stories that connect you with the past. Search for obituaries, marriage announcements, birth announcements, photos, and more in papers from across the United States, 
the UK, Canada, and beyond, stretching back three centuries. And for listeners of this podcast, newspapers.com is offering 20% off a subscription. So you can start exploring today. Just use the code Genealogy Gems. Altogether, no spaces, Genealogy Gems at checkout. That's code Genealogy Gems to get 20% off today at newspapers.com. Are you in search of a free facility to help you take your family history research to the next level? Well, consider planning a trip to one of my favorite places, the Genealogy Center at Allen County Public Library. It's located in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and the Genealogy Center is the second largest center in the nation for genealogy and one of the best places to research family histories due to its really extensive collection and services. The Genealogy Center has more than 1 million physical items, and they've got trained genealogists who work there who all have unique specialties, and they're available to help you find success for free. Use the services and materials at the Genealogy Center in Fort Wayne, Indiana to take your family history research to that next level. Plan your trip or book an appointment at visitfortwayne.com slash genealogy. That's visitfortwayne.com slash genealogy. Now back to our conversation with Dr. Claire Glenn. So it's an online course. Tell us a little bit about the logistics. You know, how long and Mm -hmm. um, do they need to have a particular background or particular degree in order to be accepted? Yeah. So um, the prerequisite for applying to the program is that you have a bachelor's, right? A bachelor's really in anything, will consider anything. Um, We do prefer a bachelor's in a scientific discipline just because it will help you with, um, you know, understanding a lot of the biological terms. Um, You know, we don't have necessarily the time to be, this is a cell and this is the (laughs) mitochondria of the cell. But I I find that most adult learners already know all that, right? Never mind what degree they already have. Um, So a bachelor's degree is the first prerequisite um, because it is a graduate certificate. So um, if you don't have a bachelor's already, you can't be awarded a graduate certificate. It's it's just as simple Mm -hmm. as that. Um, so as I said, then I consider anyone with any background, um, any, it doesn't matter if your bachelor's was in sociology or your bachelor's was in forensic science, um, everyone is considered for that. Um, with the application process, it is, uh, you know, submit your application online, submit your resume. Thankfully, we don't require that dreaded GRE. Um, that's no longer required, nor do we require letters of reference or anything like that. Um, it's resume transcripts and your, uh, a brief statement of purpose. The statement of purpose being there so that I can get an idea of where you want to go with this. Why do you want to do this? Um, uh, and so that I can, if someone has, you know, ideas of, oh, I want to, work for the FBI and be a DNA analyst for them. I'm like, okay, but this isn't your ticket into that, right? Because you need to have a a degree in forensic science or traditional science first to um, do that. So then with the program, as as you mentioned, it is fully online and it's taught asynchronously. So now, thanks to the pandemic, practically everyone knows what asynchronous means. Um, I wouldn't call it self-paced because with self-paced is that's kind of interpreted as, oh, you just go at your own pace and you do the work here and there. It's not like that at all. It's very much we have um, uh, modules published on a weekly basis. The assignments for those need to be completed on a weekly basis. So I, that's why I wouldn't call it self-paced, but it's asynchronous learning. So each week a new module will publish in each course and um, that will have pre-recorded lectures. It will have assignments, both written and then practical assignments as well. Um, and then, you know, there's the usual like end of term exam, uh, online exam uh, or final paper. It really depends upon the course, which one uh, we're doing that for. So I designed the program so that it would be f- four courses, but it would be sequential semesters that they're delivered in. So the first course, that Fundamentals of Forensic Biological Evidence, that's delivered in uh, spring one mini term. 
Um, mm-hmm. Many of your listeners may not be familiar with mini terms or accelerated terms because certainly it's a relatively new thing in higher education where most of us are used to that 15 week semester of the fall for 15 weeks and the spring for 15 weeks. Whereas with online education and especially for micro credentials such as certificates, um, there's much more of a demand for mini terms. So it's 15 weeks worth of work, but it's it delivered in seven and a half weeks. So it's half yeah. the time. Right. But the intention is to only take one course at a time. Whereas, you know, in a traditional master's program, you're taking four or five courses at one time. So the first course is delivered in the spring one mini semester every year, which runs from mid January to mid March. Then the spring two mini term is mid March to mid May. Um, and that's the second course forensic genetic genealogy. Then we have the summer semester, which makes it a little bit tricky because the summer semester uh, is typically about 12 weeks long. And if you were to do a mini term, that would only be six weeks. And for that, it would be the traditional genealogy course, or we've renamed it genealogy principles and methods. And six weeks is too short for that. Plus, it's the summer. It's the summer. (laughs) People had vacations planned or or things like that. And we found last year that six weeks was just too short of a time period. People were under way too much pressure and were too overwhelmed with the volume of information that they were taking in in just a six week period. So what we've done for the 2022 cohort is that that um, same course, same volume of work, same curriculum is just being delivered in a 12 week period as opposed to six week period so that it gives people a little bit of breathing room and they're not um, overwhelmed. So then the final course, the practicum, um, that it will be in the fall one mini semester, uh, and that runs from end of August to mid October. And that's the completion of the course. So you can do the whole program uh, in 10 months uh, from beginning to end with one course per semester or mini semester, however you want to call it. Did you find that most people had a background in genealogy or did you have some people who that was not something that they were into? Um, no, I had a lot of complete novices, a lot, ah. and a lot of a lot of those people were the law enforcement affiliated people. Right. Um, the majority of those were that they had heard of genealogy, they were a little bit interested. They had taken a twenty three and Me test many years ago, but had never looked at the results. You know? Right. Right. Um, and they were, you know, fascinated by this new forensic field that we have, and so wanted to add it to their skill set. Um, whereas it was really the non law enforcement affiliated group that, uh, uh, had already been doing a lot of them, not all of them. A lot of them have been doing genealogy for, for quite a number of years. So we really do have quite a wide berth in terms of, um, uh, experience and skill level. And with that being said, you know, for in particular, for the third course in the program, the uh, genealogy principles and methods, which is kind of all the traditional genealogy stuff. There was a few people in last year's program who had, you know, quite a bit of experience in genealogy themselves already. Some of them had taken Boston University's um, certificate Mm -hmm. course in genealogy research. Um, And I was wondering at the time, you know, maybe they're not going to find this uh, extremely useful, but maybe they will. Uh, And whenever I uh, asked those people afterwards, they're like, oh, no, I learned a lot in this. It really supplemented what I already knew Um, uh, and I really like strength strengthened their foundation in that area. So I was delighted to hear that. Um, Okay. Mm -hmm. So everybody's dying to know where they find you online. How do they uh, learn more about the program and perhaps even apply? Sure. Um, So if you go into Google and you type in University of New Haven and my name, Claire Glynn, uh, I should be the first thing that pops up. Uh, Or if you just go to the University of New Haven website, which is www.newhaven.edu. And in the search bar there, just type in forensic genetic genealogy and the program will pop up. Uh, And you'll learn more about the program there, more about the course descriptions, things like that, and the application process. And right there on the right hand side, there's an apply now button uh, and you can go ahead and apply. Fantastic. Hey, 
congratulations on getting this course together. And I just think it's fantastic. I love hearing that you're focused on the standards. And uh, I could talk to you all day, and, and we haven't even gotten to my Irish genealogy yet. So, you ah, know, yes. we'll, <laughs> we'll have to do that next time. Claire, exactly. Glenn, thank you so much for joining me here on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. Thanks for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode at number 267. And you can find the show notes for this episode that includes the article as well as a companion video version of this conversation that you've heard today. Uh, that's over at genealogygems.com. And when you visit the website, uh, right there on the homepage, you can sign up for my free email newsletter comes out once a week lets you know about everything going on at genealogy gems the podcast uh, the articles the videos everything to help you be more successful in finding your family history thanks so much for listening my friend i'll talk to you soon